Lecture 2, Module 3, Define Stage, Part 1. Defining the process. In the first module, we defined the problem. Second module, we defined the needs. And in the third module, we'll be defining the process itself. And then in the stage, stage 2 of the Define Phase, we'll go on to define the project itself, which is actually quite involved. First, let's talk about inputs and outputs. Every process is comprised of steps that have inputs and outputs. All of these inputs and outputs can be measured and evaluated as to their effect on the process. And here we see an input-output process model. All processes have inputs, sometimes labeled X's, and all processes have outputs, sometimes labeled Y's. And a process can be described mathematically as Y equals the function of X, or the number of X's. Now a process can have many inputs. And at the same time, there can be quite a few outputs. There's a way of, uh, of uh, describing these inputs in terms of, uh, of the types of inputs, and these are called the six M's. This is one way. Uh, as you see here, methods, machines, manpower, materials, measurements, and also Mother Nature. And all these inputs can be grouped into the following 6M classifications, as it shows here. And each of these inputs may have an effect on the outputs of the, of the process uh, uh, itself and the quality attributes. Now, as we see, there's variability in each one of these inputs, and they all affect the overall variability of the output. Now, note that this is from an, a, a presentation called Understanding Key Terms for Modern Quality Assessment uh, by John E. Simmons, Ph.D., from CEDAR, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research of the Food and Drug Administration. Now, as they point out, all these inputs affect the overall process output. So the FDA expects us to pay attention to the inputs of our processes. Now, each of these inputs can vary in their average values and standard deviations. So where they are on target and how much variability they have will also affect the outcome of the quality attributes. So it's very important for us to understand uh, the, in, the inputs and their variability and the effect they have on the outputs and their variability. One of the ways to uh, map a process, so looking at the outputs, is to use Ishikawa diagrams or fault tree of uh, 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 fishbone uh, diagrams. And as you see here, uh, an input can be watched, uh, an input two and then input three and an input four, making the uh, characteristic fishbone uh, structure. And each one of those inputs along the process can be evaluated for its effect on the output. There are many inputs and outputs in a manufacturing operation. The output of each process becomes the input to another process, and every process is dependent on the input from several other processes, and these are the six M's. All inputs and outputs of a particular process should be measurable so that we can actually measure them and try to control them. So here we see uh, a number of outputs coming from one part of the operation, for instance, the output from blending becomes an input into granulation. Granulation output becomes an input into drying, and the drying output becomes an imp input into compression. Now, process rule number one, no process without measurement. Process mapping. A process map illustrates the individual steps of a process using various connected symbols. The symbols are linked in sequence and show items such as each of the inputs and outputs, what the decision points and choices are along the way, what data ge is generated, and what documentation is generated. And there's a nice little video on, on how to do process mapping. Process mapping can identify for you the non-value added steps. It can reveal problems such as process bottlenecking where everything is getting bunched up. It can identify opportunities for improvement in the process. And it can define proposed changes in the improve phase. And it can define the new process in the control phase. Another type of uh, process mapping is called SIPOC, and the acronym stands for Suppliers, Inputs, Process, Outputs, and Customers. And it's a tool that can be used to help identify uh, these processes within an organization. So uh, this would be looking at uh, quite often at internal customers. And within a, within a company, uh, various departments serve other departments. So manufacturing may be making product that will go to packaging. Uh, so packaging is a customer of, of manufacturing. So uh, what, what are they supplying to them and how are they supplying it? Uh, SIPOC is a, is a way of mapping all this to see who's, who's, the, who's sending what to where, who's the supplier, who are the customers. And this is a great way to figure out where things are going so you can look for opportunities to improve. 
Now, it's all, also important to be aware that an improvement in one process may create problems in other process. So uh, if there's an improvement in manufacturing where things are moving a lot faster, that can cause pileups in packaging. So that all has to be weighed out. Now, there's a video on creating a SIPOC. And the SIPOC and fishbone uh, cause and effects diagrams uh, help allow the user to study the relationship between inputs and outputs. Process capability, which we've already talked about, is a measure that shows how well the process fits within its specification range. And there are several measures that are used. Uh, the most common ones are CP, or just basic process capability, CPK, process capability index, and then PP, the process performance, and then process performance index, PPK. Now these are very closely related. One's uh, looking at the short term and one's looking at the long term. Now CP, as we've discussed is, uh, discussed, is the ratio of the specification range to the Six Sigma, or the range of the data. So here we see the specification range between the lower specification and upper specification, and then we see the range of the data, which is equi equal to the Six Sigma. So process capability is the upper specification minus the lower specification divided by Six Sigma. And if the variation of the process perfectly fits the specification, then the process capability is 1. And as we said, almost. And here are some examples of process capabilities and how they appear compared to their specifications. So in the upper left-hand corner, we see a process capability of 1. And you see the green hours. The, uh, the spread of the data is exactly almost equal to the spread of the, uh, of the specification range. In the upper right-hand corner, we see a process capability of 1.33. So we've added one, actually one standard deviation to the specification, moved it out one standard deviation. So you have an extra standard deviation there, and you can see that the process fits much better, and that's why it's 1.33. In the lower left-hand corner, we have a process capability of 1.66. And as you can see now, we've opened it up to five standard deviations, and uh, the process fits a lot better. And on the bottom right-hand uh, corner, uh, the process capability is 2.0, and now we have three standard deviations on both sides, and the process fits very, very, very well. And again, that's two, two standard, uh, two process capability of two is six sigma. Process capability. Note that CP considers only the spread and not the centering of the process. You can have a capable process, it'll get a CPK of greater than one, and you can still make tons of out of spec product if it's not on target. The process capability index is a more sensitive measure of the centeredness of a process. And in this case, we're looking at uh, 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 the spread of data in, in between uh, two specification levels. And you notice uh, on the left-hand side, the distance between the data and the lower specification is further away than on the upper specification level. So the data is closer uh, to the upper specification level. So in this case, we will take the average of the data and we'll take the mean and the upper specification level and subtract them and we'll look at three standard deviations. So the CPK in this case would be upper specification level minus the mean divided by three standard deviations or if it was closer on the other side, if it was closer to the lower specification level, uh, we do the opposite. So it would be the mean minus the lower specification level divided by three, six, three, three sigma. The value of process capability, capability indices to Six Sigma projects is that they, uh, they really compare the voice of the customer and that what the customer wants from the process, and that's basically your specifications, what the customer wants, to the voice of the process, what the process is capable of delivering to the customer may not be the same thing. Manufacturing met metrics. All manufacturing has some typical basic measures of performance that we should look at before we start talking about some lean measures. Process time. How long does it take to perform a step? Waiting time. How long a product or a service waits between two different step, process steps? Work in progress or WIP. The amount of product or service that is waiting between steps, piling up. Cycle time. How long it takes a product service to get from the beginning to the end? And then the completion rate. The amount of product services completed in, in a certain time period. For, for example, maybe an eight hour shift. Now, critical to schedule metrics. A critical to schedule metric is a measure of the time it takes to complete a manufacturing or business process. The Six Sigma team selects the critical to schedule metrics that will satisfy the customer's schedule requirements. So a customer may want something done within a week or within a day, and, and that sets the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the schedule. Typical to critical schedule metrics are cycle time, which we already talked about, 
process cycle efficiency, process lead time, the velocity, and the overall equipment effectiveness, or also known as OEE. Cycle time. This is the total elapsed time for a process from start to finish. It's important to understand that elapsed time does not equal actual value added time. Cycle time e equals actual time, actual value added time plus any waiting time. Now, cycle time in the pharmaceutical industry has been poor to horrendous. Uh, in one study <coughs> at a very large multinational company, the cycle time for one product from a customer placing an order to delivery and considering all worst case lead times for delivery of, let's say, uh, uh, the raw materials and, uh, and components, vials, bottles, labels, the, 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 all the worst case, the, the cycle time was 300 days. Very clearly a candidate for Six Sigma, and, and cycle time would be an important critical to schedule metric. Now, can you imagine ordering a book uh, on Amazon.com and waiting one year to get it? Would you go somewhere else? Well, that's, that's true in the pharmaceutical industry. The companies that can deliver products on time uh, and, and, and within the schedule of the, of the customer who's ordering it are the ones who will be successful. Process cycle efficiency. Process cycle efficiency is the value added time divided by the total lead time of the process. So if a process only had value added activities, then the process cycle efficiency will be equal to 100%. This is highly unlikely, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. In actuality, process cycle efficiencies are pretty poor, and less than about 10%. And process cycle efficiencies of greater than 25% can be seen in processes that have really been improved by lean. Process lead time is the number of items completed by a process in one hour. Basically, how many can you get done in an hour? For example, if in one's complete shift, uh, eight hours, you can package two batches of a topical cream, then the process lead time for that product is 0 0.25, or basically two batches in an eight hour shift. So if you get an order for 10 batches of that topical cream product, how long will it take you to package that order? Well, 10 divided by 0.25 equals 40 hours. It'll take you one week to get that done. Velocity is the process lead time divided by the total number of value added steps in the process. Velocity is a measure of how quickly a process gets done. So using our topical cream example, the process lead time for 10 batches was 40 hours. If there are only five value added steps in the process, then the velocity is five steps divided by 40 or 0.125 steps per hour. The higher the velocity, the faster work gets done. OEE, this is a very important lean metric that combines process availability, performance, and quality all into one metric. It's become very, very popular in, 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 very, in regular daily operations, even outside of Six Sigma. And OEE is calculated as this. OEE equals A times P times Q, where A is the actual operating time divided by the plan time, P is the ideal cycle time divided by the actual cycle time, and Q is the acceptable output divided by the total output or the yield of the process. A little more detail on that. <clears throat> availability is calculated as the actual time the process was producing product divided by the time that was planned to run the process. So actual time includes actual running time and downtime. Downtime is any time the process is down that was not scheduled. For example, breakdowns. Uh, something went wrong with the, pr with, the, with the line and had to be fixed. Plan time <coughs> is the planned operating time minus any breaks, maintenance, changeovers, things that things are that are expected. So this is the actual planned time for, for operation. And breaks, lunch, and things like that are not counted. OEE performance is calculated as the ideal cycle time divided by the actual cycle time. So the ideal cycle time is how long a process should run if all conditions are ideal. No raw materials are delivered late, no operator makes any errors, uh, everybody shows up on time, so it's, it's a, a perfect situation. A process running at 100% OEE performance would be running at maximum velocity. OEE quality is calculated as the amount of acceptable output divided by the total output. And this is also called first pass quality. So a process running at 100% OEE quality is producing no errors, no defects, everything's perfect. Critical to cost metrics. Uh, these are measures of the value of Six Sigma project activities to the business. Uh, there are many financial analyses that need to be performed to calculate what the benefits of Six Sigma projects have been. The Six Sigma team selects the critical to cost metrics that will satisfy the customer's cost requirements. 
typical critical to cost metrics are break even points. When are you going? When are you going to break even? Uh, time value of money, the future value, the net present value, and the internal rate of, uh, of return are all important metrics uh, for a project. Uh, if it's not worth doing the project, if you're not making any money or saving any money, then uh, why are you doing the project? So the, this is a very, very important uh, metric. Now, although the critical to cost metrics are very important to Six Sigma projects, they are normally handled by finance departments who are much, much better versed in financial calculations and how to ha handle all these things. Uh, this is why a financial support person is named on Six Sigma project charters, which we'll discuss uh, in the lecture three modules. Critical to cost metrics are typically calculated from critical to quality metrics and critical to schedule metrics. Now, since these metrics are developed and handled outside of normal Six Sigma team activities, they will not be discussed in, in detail in this course. Primary and secondary metrics. After completing the process map or site block, you then determine which outputs are most important to the customer. Primary, primary metrics are typically one or more of the direct output characteristics of the process, and they're normally a direct measure of the quality, cycle time, or cost. Secondary metrics are, are derived from a primary metric. That is, they cannot be calculated without knowing the primary metric. Secondary metrics may be desired to monitor so that changes to the process that improve with the primary metric do not adversely affect some other talk part of the process that is monitored by the secondary metric. So you're watching things uh, somewhere distantly related to the uh, primary metric. KPIs, key performance indicators. These are quantifiable measures that will reflect the critical success factors the organization has decided upon. These are picked by the organization. And the KPIs will differ depending on the organization, and they can change even within the organization as time goes by. Some examples may be first pass quality and uh, rolled throughput yield, which we've talked about. Lean measures are used to understand the lean performance of a process organization. Some typical lean measures are the process cycle efficiency, which we talked about, OEE, which we talked about, and tack time, also sometimes called the drumbeat. Tact is a German word for the baton that the conductor uses to, uh, uh, to, to conduct the orchestra. And in this case, uh, tack time, the, the use of it is the, uh, the, 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 the value is calculated by dividing the available work time, you know, a day or shift, by the number of products required by the customer in the same period. So the available work time divided by the customer demand. And why this is called tack time is if you think about, you think about a, um, a conductor who is setting the beat for the orchestra, but the orchestra can't keep up. Uh, he's saying, I need these many, these many notes uh, in a certain time frame, but the orchestra is not, uh, is not keeping up with that. So there's obviously room for improvement. But the tack time is set by the conductor. In this case, it would be the customer would be setting the tack time. What is the demand uh, of the customer? Now, another tool that's very, very important in looking at, at your process is a, a failure modes and effects analysis also known as FMEA. FMEA evaluates the severity of potential failures and the likelihood of these failures and also the detect detectability of such failures to arrive at some risk priority number that's used to rank the failures and then determine the need for remediation. FMEA relies on product and process understanding which are very important to the FDA in terms of our pharmaceutical products. And the FDA can really break down complex processes into manageable steps and makes it a lot easier to analyze. Some potentials there of use, FMA can use to prioritize risks and monitor the effectiveness of, of risk control activities later on in, in, the, in, the pro, in the project. And FMA can be applied to pharmaceutical equipment, to the facilities, it can be used to study a process and, and its basic, basic effects on the product. Uh, risk reduction can be used to eliminate or control the potential failures. And the results in FMEA can also be used as a basis for design. So uh, you'll you see this tool also being used in design for Six Sigma. Failure modes, effects, and criticality analysis, FMECA. The FMEA can be extended to consider the criticality of the consequences of a failure. Now, in order to perform an FMECA, you need to have a product or a process specification. Uh, without them, you really can't tell if anything's critical or not. So if you have specifications, <coughs> it's not a bad idea to use an FMECA instead of FMEA. <coughs> FMECA can then identify process steps where a failure mode could lead to a product failing a specification, and then additional steps to reduce these critical risks can be taken. Uh, FMEA, uh, can, FMECA rather, can also be used uh, to identify critical parameters and critical controls in manufacturing processes. 
Now, as I mentioned, there's severity, likelihood, and, and uh, detectability, and there's usually scales that are put together. Now, as you see here, the severity scale is, is a 1 to 10 scale, and 10 up on the top, it says hazardous without warning, very high severity ranking with a potential failure mode, uh, maybe affecting the safe system operation without warning. This may be a, uh, a ranking scale for a piece of equipment that, that may be damaged. So at the very high high end, the 10, 9, and 8, you see are all red, and then we have three uh, yellows and three greens. All the way down to severity is none, there's no effect whatsoever. So there's all these gradations in between. And then probability, you may have a rank of very high failure is almost inevitable, that's a very bad, bad thing. All the way down to the bottom where remote failure is unlikely or basically never happens. So that would be a 1 all the way up to a 10. Uh, and then you see failure probabilities. There's some numbers in there, 1 in 20, 1 in 80. Uh, that's if you have that information, and you can put that in, into your scale. And then detectability. At the high end, uh, undetectable. You would never know if something went wrong. Uh, that would be a 10 uh, all the way down to the bottom, where almost certain you would definitely catch this. If something went wrong, it would be picked off. Again, notice there's three greens, three yellows. Uh, this may change depending on uh, you know how how high you rank different things and how you define uh, these likelihoods of detection and detectability uh, occurrence and severity. Now to show how these are being used, this is an FMEA uh, that's uh, that's been created in Excel. Uh, very very common to do these in Excel. It makes it very very easy. And uh, you'll, you'll see here, uh, these are terminal sterilization steps. So the process step is all terminal sterilization. Step description is the final sterilization of some pre-filled syringes. And there's some potential failure modes. Uh, and if you look at the bottom one, uh, in row number 10, some syringes do not reach killing temperature. So the potential effect of that failure is non-sterile product. Well, that severity would be very, very high. <coughs> so now we could have an unsterile product uh, that could kill somebody. So that would be one of the highest severities. Notice that it's turned red. Uh, potential causes, too many syringes placed in the chamber. Well, we've overloaded the chamber that we're trying to sterilize in it. The occurrence, so uh, we have that as an eight, and that was chosen, the probability uh, is, is high. And the reason why is in the current controls, there are none. The SOP does not limit load sizes. So you know what, it's very common for the operator to load the thing up and uh, you know put in too many too many syringes so this could happen quite frequently so that's that's a high high a potentially high occurrence detectability what's the ability to detect an unsterile uh, uh, syringe virtually none unless you tested all of them you would never know so this, the detectability is very very high on that notice that the rpn number is red and it's an 800 also the criticality is a one uh, obviously, we we're going to have unsterile product that uh, that's never going to be a, an acceptable specification. Now you note that the scores, uh, you know, at certain threshold values, automatically are formatted red, yellow, or green. Uh, that's one of the neat things of using Excel. You can use conditional formatting to set certain criteria that if it's above or below a certain level, it changes color, and this makes a you know, very visual warning to the team of the importance. So uh, aside from that, uh, the other thing great about Excel is that it can be sorted. So you see the RPN numbers are 150, 30, 800, <coughs> and there can, be, there can be several hundred of these things. And then they can be sorted so you know which ones are the worst ones up on top, and, the, and the, it can be uh, prioritized for what action you want to take first. Now a, a note about these scales, uh, the 1 to 10 scales probably sounded fairly uh, you know, intelligent to you. But the, the, the 1 to 10 scales uh, create the possibility of uh, RPN values that range anywhere from 1, 1 times 1 times 1, all the way up to 1,000, 10 times 10 times 10. However, there are really only 120 possible RPN values. And worse, the 120 possible values occur with very different frequencies, with 1,000 only occurring once, but 360 occurring 15 times. For instance, 360 is not a very high score on a scale of 1 to 1,000, so that may be considered uh, you know, low, where, where there may not be a lot of activity in terms of, of uh, remediation. Now, as it turns out, 862 of the 1,000 possible combinations will have a smaller RPN score than 360. This really shouldn't seem right. Let's look at this table, uh, where the RPN score of 60 uh, is, it can be associated with risks that are very high severity up on top. So the severity of the problem is a 10, uh, the likelihood is very high in 9, and the likelihood of detection is a 4. 
that comes out to 360, all the way down to the bottom, number 15, the severity of the problem is very low, 4, the likelihood of occurrence is very high, and detection is uh, impossible, 10. Um, the very low severity is probably something not important, uh, you know, a low, low risk. Uh, of the one on top, uh, number one, is a very, very high risk. So the same number can be associated with very, very high severity or very, very low severity uh, with the same value. So they, these numbers should not be viewed simply at face value. Interesting article uh, uh, in Quality Digest that's cited there. So the definition, again we're defining things, the fa definition of your scales and the calculation of your RPM numbers must be a very thoughtful exercise. The tables that I showed before are just examples. You should not use them. You should come up with your own scales and, and do them, uh, use them intelligently. One uh, thing that's suggested is instead of multiplying the numbers together is to add them, concatenate the numbers. So uh, you know, a 9 and an 8 and a 7 would be 987 or a 1 and a 3 and a, and a 7 would be 137, that kind of thing. And that, and that would help in, in also on prioritizing. So overall, the process of FMEA, <coughs> FMEA can systematically focus the team on process details revealing previously unnoticed potential problems. A lot of things bubble up in, in an FMEA that nobody realized before. And it can rank possible failures by their, their effect on the customer. They're a valuable tool. And they can document the risks of failure and plan actions to reduce the risks. Uh, the table uh, that you saw on the uh, on the couple slides ago didn't show all of the uh, FMEA because there's other other uh, fields where you can uh, put in corrective actions and follow-ups. And you can improve the reliability and quality of the process and help meet customer needs using the FMEA FMECA tools.